Well, welcome people to the University of New Hampshire through the, uh, through the internet. Uh, instead of braving the uh, difficult roads here uh, between uh, 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 Vermont and New Hampshire, I'm, uh, I'm sitting in the comfort of my office. And uh, it's not quite the same. I, this, therefore, I can't bring hard copies of my bird damage prevention publication with me. But you'll see at the uh, very last slide in my presentation, I'll give the URL that shows where you can get this publication online. It's available online. Uh, and uh, I've truncated this a little bit so that it can cover uh, bird problems on oilseed uh, crops rather than focusing on my usual area, which is uh, in uh, fruits and uh, vegetables. A couple of points to make uh, at the very beginning. And, and the first one is that birds are in intelligent, certainly compared to insects, fungi, and weeds that I usually work with. And that means they learn. And so this is an important point to remember when you're trying to deal with them. They learn. They can change their behavior if you do something, and they can, they can learn as a result. Also, bird problems vary according to the crop, according to the location, and according to nearby features that you have. And so you can have one farm with a, a, a rather different set of uh, bird problems than another farm only a relatively short distance away because the crop is different, the location is different. Maybe one is by a big marsh or something, and therefore you've got a lot of blackbirds at one and not at the other. So nearby features and location can, affect, uh, can significantly affect the problems we have. Also, recognizing the species of birds that cause the problems can help you improve management. When I talk to people about dealing with <clears throat> insect problems, when I'm, when I'm lecturing to the, to the apple growers, for example, I just don't talk about uh, applying insecticides to control insects. We target specific ones by understanding when they appear and what their behavior is and so forth. Well, the same with birds. There's a significant difference in the behaviors of the different species. So if you're trying to control birds, uh, you may not be as successful as if you are if you focus on the particular species that give you problems. Incorporating variability and change in what you use really helps, unless, of course, you do a complete exclusion like using netting. But if you're using noisemakers or taste repellents or, or, or visual deterrents, um, incorporating variability and change can make a major difference in the uh, degree of success that you enjoy. It's also important, if you can, to handle problems before a strong feeding pattern develops. Because it, once that does, it becomes much, much harder to stop. So you want to kind of nip things in the bud before they get really bad. Birds that we have in this part of the country fall, at least with respect to pest birds, they fall into two general groups. And one of them are the species that flock during the season. Uh, during the, I put on this slide during the fruiting season, but uh, uh, during, the, during the growing season anyway. And amongst these, uh, starlings, blackbirds, grackles, cedar waxwings, Canada geese aren't problems in oil seeds, as far as I know. Crows are, and crows sometimes are flocking. So these are species that have a cert certain types of behaviors, and they respond a little differently than the other group, and that is species that occur in resident pairs, mom and dad, and, and later on in the season, mom and dad and the kids. And those particular species set up a territory and they defend it from others of their species. And since they have invested a lot to protect and defend that territory, it's really hard to scare them off. Examples of uh, uh, scarlet tanager, orioles, robin, and mockingbird. Heather will have a test later on. We'll see who knows what this species was. I can't, I can't hear the audience, so I don't know yet, but we'll move on. I'm guessing from my limited experience with oilseed crops down here that the most likely bird problems are going to be on this list right here. Crow, and in your area, you've got raven as well, blackbirds, starlings, and maybe in some situations, grackles and blue jays. 
in certain spots there are other seed eaters that flock that might be a serious problem, I don't know, and these include some of the finches, there's two in particular that are on my suspect list, the purple finch and the house finch. And uh, uh, many species that are common at backyard feeders and live as pairs are not really likely to be serious pests. You might think they were if they, if they like sunflower seed a lot, for example. Cardinal is an example of one of those. But since they occur in, in, in ones and twos and small groups, uh, probably not a, a significant problem. Uh, usually when I'm talking to fruit growers, uh, we spend quite a bit of time talking about netting, but I don't know if that's particularly appropriate for what we're talking about today. Netting usually is not practical for annual crops. Uh, I'll show you an example of something in a minute that's getting closer and closer to it, and it might have application. But normally we talk about netting as being the most effective technique you know, the, the series of posts and wires and the netting itself really restrict your access to equip with equipment. Uh, it's very pricey, but of course the materials last for many, many years. And so since it's very expensive and it's hard to move this stuff, it's not particularly a practical for annual crops. But here's an option of something that we're starting to see uh, used increasingly here. In fact, this is a Vermont picture just over the border into Vermont. Uh, somewhere in the uh, northern part of the uh, the upper part of the Connecticut River Valley. Um, this is one of the ones that manufacturers are calling bird and hail netting. And this is one that's relatively light and it's actually laid, this is a strawberry crop. And the grower here was using it and laying it right over the crop because the uh, period of time when they suffered bird damage on this is relatively short. And they found that this was a significant deterrent and worked pretty well. And so here's something that uh, doesn't require posts and wires and so forth. You can set it over a crop. You can move it later on. Some of these are, are relatively light, and they might be options. A couple of questions there. They might be options for use in oilseed crops. But I think we'll go on to the other more traditional things, uh, and I'll talk about various scaring devices. First, the auditory ones, the noisemakers. A point to make at the outset relative to noisemakers is all species, all of them that we have, become habituated to your noise. And since they become habituated to noise, if you're using noisemakers, incorporate changes, incorporate variability in what you use. If you have a noisemaker that's out there and it says, boo, over and over and over again, hour after hour, day after day, boo, boo, uh, it, after a very short time, it doesn't get very scary. But uh, if after a little while you start changing it and you add some other noises or something else that they're schmack or some other scary thing, um, it can significantly lengthen the period that the noises are effective. So variability and change, especially important in using these things. A common thing we hear from our growers is they try noisemakers and they work for a short time and then the birds get used to them. Yep, that's it. Devices that can vary their noises are usually more effective than those that can't, usually. And flocking species are much more easily scared than species that live in resident pairs or, or, or maybe small family groups and defend it as their territory. Also, immature birds, and by this I mean birds that are less than one year old, are less affected than adults because the response to many of the noises is a learned response. And so often we'll see juveniles and they are a noisemaker and they just haven't learned uh, as the rest of the birds are in the flock, that it's a, a scary thing. Let's see, I don't have slides on all of these. Uh, there's screamers and bangers, those are pyrotechnic uh, devices. Firecrackers rigged up on a slow fuse, aluminum pans. All of these are possibilities. I've got a couple slides on a couple of the more likely things to talk about. And the first one is to talk about the pyrotechnic devices. These can get birds moving, and they can be an important part of a scare program, but they're really not likely, unless your name is Rockefeller, I guess, 
uh, you're, na you're, you're not likely to use these as the main part of your SCARE program. These are uh, devices that are put on this little bitty uh, plastic, it, it's called a launcher now, and they make it look so that you can't hold up a, a, a bank with it. And uh, you put one on the launcher and fire it, and it uh, shoots off maybe 100 yards and makes a bang, or maybe 50 yards or so. And since they cost two bucks or more per shot, um, it's not the kind of thing you'd rely on initially, uh, rely on for the whole season. But you might find it very useful to get birds moving and get them out of there and, 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 and get them starting to feel uh, nervous about uh, being in your fields. Banging aluminum pans, this is a New Hampshire picture. And uh, I guess my summary of that is uh, they're very low cost and very low effect. Uh, they make a little bit of banging when the wind is blowing and they have a little bit of a flash, but if, you're, if your crop is really attractive to them, they're, they're, they're not going to do a whole lot. Here's an example of something that can be very effective, and this particular brand of noisemaker is one, if you look on the upper left, those of you that are relatively close to the screen, you'll see that there's eight different sounds that this particular one can be programmed to give off and you can do combinations of them. And you can also have them at intervals, and it can uh, shoot through four different speakers. See the speaker blog plugs at the bottom. And so it can vary the kinds of noises. You can mix sounds one, three, and seven, maybe, or the next day use sounds four, five, and two, or whatever you want. And this is a kind of a device that you can program to a particular situation, and you can change the program as the birds get used to stuff. So uh, having the option really improves the effectiveness. The cost when I did this publication varied anywhere from 200 bucks to the Cadillac model, which was about $3,000. And uh, this one is in use. You can see it covered with spray material. So it's in use in a uh, vineyard not far from the university here. Automated propane cannons are something that's available. You see in my state, a fish and game is still uh, uh, lends these out upon occasion when there's a wildlife that's causing a problem and a particular grower wants to borrow one for a time. Um, there are a number of things to comment about these. Some of the automated cannons fire at regular intervals like every five minutes or every ten minutes and you can program it. Uh, some of them uh, also have a remote uh, device, kind of like a garage door opener, and you can point it at the device from your pickup truck or wherever you are and push the, the remote, and it'll make it go bang. The key thing about these to remember is they're really, really annoying <laughs> to workers, customers, and neighbors. And in my state, and I understand in your state as well, they are some ca the cause of some very, very serious neighbor problems and uh, uh, lawsuits. Why? Because they're really annoying. Birds get used to them very quickly. They're best on the flocking species. Uh, they are a frequent vandalism target. Why? Because they're very annoying. And the costs range, at least when I did my publication, from about 350 to about 750 bucks. Um, that's about all I can say on them. People frequently ask about the possibility of shooting. And uh, shooting is a possibility in some situations. Uh, there are legal limitations. Uh, a situation in which you're allowed to shoot, a time of year when you're allowed to shoot, a time of day when you're allowed to shoot, certain species that you can shoot, others you can't. There are safety issues, there are neighbor issues, uh, and unless you want to cultivate a farmer Rambo image, you might not want to do this if you're a place that has pick your own customers. The main effect in dealing with uh, uh, shooting is scaring away the survivors. It's not by knocking down the numbers of the birds, it's by scaring away the survivors. And that gives you a clue that the more intelligent birds are easier to scare off in a shooting program. 
Um, I've got a few things to comment about visual scare devices. Again, incorporating variability and change can be key to making this work, making a program that's so-so in effectiveness turn into one that's very effective by incorporating change and variability in what you, what you use. And also combining, perhaps, a visual device with an auditory device. There are various things. All of these are possibilities. Some are more appropriate than others. I'll go over a couple that are relatively uh, common and may have some applicability in your situation. The first is to talk about effigies. Um, they range in cost from 12 to 60 bucks a piece. Some of them incorporate movement, like a bobblehead on a on a hawk, a, a, a fake hawk or a fake owl. Um, the most effective uh, use of these comes when you move them around. We have a grower in the Connecticut River Valley that moved their, uh, moved their uh, images twice a day. They moved them once at 7 in the morning and they moved them once at noontime. And they were very, very effective because they kept moving the stuff. Pretty much the birds learn if the same stupid old owl is sitting on the same perch all summer that it's not going to harm them. But if it moves all over the place, um, they're caught off guard, especially if it's also fairly realistic in its placement and appearance. Um, this, was at a particular, this was at one of my New Hampshire growers. Uh, a, an unnatural position like this isn't going to fool anybody. So it takes some time. You don't just put them out and forget about them. You've got to kind of pay attention to them. Uh, the so-called scare-eye balloons. Uh, cost anywhere from 10 bucks, the smaller ones, which are about uh, uh, 18 inches across, 16 inches across or so. The real big one in the foreground there is about, uh, I think that's about two feet across, and it's got the holographic eyes, the so-called moving eyes, and the gr growers reported to me repeatedly that that was more effective than the smaller one, which doesn't have those, those moving eyes. The effective distance is just a few yards and it varies from crop to crop. Since it's a visual thing, if the birds can hide from it so that it's not visible to them, then it's not, not very effective. So it's a, there's a limited effect of these things if the, if the crop is really a big lure. If they're really hungry and they really need to go after it, then they're, they're going to do so, and these don't work all that well. A prominently hanging dead crow is very effective on both crows and ravens. I believe it's illegal to shoot a raven, but of course, uh, and crows only have certain, in your state as well, there's only certain weeks uh, when you're allowed to shoot them. They're, they're protected by international as well as uh, federal laws and local state laws. Um, but there are certain periods of time when you can, and what uh, one of our managers does at the uh, university's uh, uh, farm up here is they uh, they shoot a crow or two during the legal season and then uh, double bag it in, in a refrigerator, and uh, in a freezer, and uh, save it until the next year. And you see this one is hung from its leg with the, with the uh, uh, wing dangling. The, the intelligent ones like uh, crows and ravens are really deterred by this. It does not work much on the dumber species, but it's really effective on crows and ravens. Again, if you've got to pick your own operation with its customers nearby, it may be somewhat unsightly and not the best visual image to offer. This photo I took very, uh, many years ago with my telephoto lens back when we had film technology for photography, and I'm looking straight up with my 300 millimeter lens, and uh, this this hawk. A kite is uh, positioned with a couple of fishing swivels, and it's it's sitting there horizontal, in a horizontal position, and uh, so it can endlessly circle around and around and around, back and forth without twisting up the line. It's got several fishing swivels, and then the distance up to the weather balloons that are holding it up is something on the order of a hundred, or maybe it was even as much as 150 feet, and then it's a uh, 150 feet or so up from the field. And so it's tethered in a situation. This has worked quite well for us in situations where there aren't high tension line, lines nearby and aren't tall trees nearby. But it takes a bit to uh, get the helium and so forth to get this together. Also, uh, uh, 
the uh, balloons are a target for uh, uh, young people with the BB guns, and so uh, there, there are some uh, problems with that. There's some taste repellents. I don't think we currently have any that are legal for use on oilseed crops, but um, methylanthranolate and sucrose have been, sucrose have been used on uh, uh, small fruits. Uh, 910 anthraquinone has been registered in Vermont since 2010, and it was first registered. I believe it's called Avipel still. And it was first re registered for repelling blackbirds from eating the seeds at planting time. And I'm hoping that as time goes on, this registration is going to be broadened for more uses, and it might eventually have a broader label. I was not able to find much more about this uh, in time for this presentation. But I'm watching this one to see if this active ingredient will have broader uses and, and frankly, in more states in the future. We'll see, uh, we'll see what develops. But that's about it as the options for taste repellents, at least the ones I'm aware of. Habitat modifications are something to think, out and think about. And when I was interviewing my growers in New Hampshire and southern Maine for this publication, I, I, I interviewed 20 or 30 of them over two years. And I heard repeatedly from growers that the best thing that happened to them was when a pair of hawks took up residence and nested on their property. And their bird population, their bird problem went way down. And this has been demonstrated again and again and again. So a live, day active bird predator is really good at scaring them away. So if you can encourage them to live or visit or nest on your farm, they're going to work for free. There's some options. This is, this is an immature red tail hawk. But uh, uh, this is the best option I can think of. My telephoto lens makes this look up close, but actually that huge house is a good long distance away. And the URL that you see below there is on our website. It's uh, the instructions on how to make uh, houses or platforms to target certain species. This one is targeted for uh, sparrow hawk, which uh, and it'll readily take to nest boxes if you put them in the right location. Uh, but that maybe that hawk is a little bit too small to scare away some of the bigger pests we would have, like the crows and ravens and things. Um, so that it, it may have limited effectiveness, nest, nest boxes or nest platforms. But there's more on that in that publication. Now, there have been no uh, studies on this in New England that I'm aware of at this point. But placing perches for raptors can encourage their use for hunting if those perches are lacking. And there's been significant studies on this in a couple of parts of the country. And so if we have situations where the perches are lacking, we can put them up there and the hawks will start using them more. And then with that presence, some of the birds that may be problems uh, uh, may be less of a problem because the hawks are, or, or baby owls are, are, are using them. We had a funny story with that here in New Hampshire a few years ago, and it worked quite well. Other options to make your, ho uh, your site less attractive to birds include uh, considering that if there are really thick shrubs and thick trees, often beds of conifers, that are really close by the crop that's getting bird problems, you might consider eliminating them. They may serve as hiding, roosting, or perching, or nesting spots. You've got to evaluate each situation. But sometimes there's a, a situation where a, there's a thick bed of stuff that really is perfect for the birds. If you can eliminate that, you can reduce the problem. Also, falconry is a possible short-term solution if you are lucky enough that a falconer, a registered falconer, lives nearby. They exercise their birds. They have to have places to do that. You could maybe offer some kind of a swap. In some parts of the Northeast, uh, falconers get big bucks to fly their birds uh, in places and scare them away uh, uh, from, uh, scare the pigeons or other things away. So if you live close enough, this might be an option for you. Maybe you can swap some of what you grow for, for this kind of a service. Uh, there's state by state rules, and uh, that might be a possibility to look at. 
Now I've incorporated, uh, since we've got only a few more minutes, I incorporated a little bit on how to identify birds that are eating your particular crops. I've chopped out some of the stuff that's most likely to be a problem in small fruits like cedar waxwing. And I've concentrated on what I think are the bigger suspects, the more likely suspects. And we'll start with this statement that just because you see birds in your fields, in your crops, please don't assume they're pests. Many of the birds that are out there are strict insect eaters, like warblers and vireos, for example. And so they're not causing problems at all. They, they may be helping you. In other cases, there are birds that uh, feed a tremendous amount on seeds, especially weed seeds, like the swamp sparrow. So just because the birds are out there doesn't mean they're pests. You want to look and see which ones they are, and a, a, a bird directory, a bird guide can tell you what they are and a little bit about what they feed on. And I started with this. Normally, if I'm in a situation where I can look at the audience, I look for a show of hands, and I ask if there's anybody that doesn't know what this one is. And yeah, this is a problem in some of our crops, but the main reason that I put this particular bird here was because everybody's familiar with it, and the length of this species is, is 10 inches. So I'm going to be comparing the stuff after this with the length of a robin. You know, smaller than a robin, it's bigger than a robin, it's about the same size. Everybody's familiar with that one. So, uh, so here we go. <clears throat> Another familiar one, crow. Uh, certainly all black. It's something on the order of 17 inches in length, so it's a big sucker, a lot bigger than a robin. It's got that distinctive call that everybody recognizes. It's also got a slightly rounded tail, and that's important because crows have a, a open season on them, but ravens do not. And in your state, ravens are relatively common, especially in the northern two-thirds of your state. And a raven is significantly larger than a crow. It's got a heavier bill, this sort of a croaking call, and it also has a wedge-shaped tail. Do you see how that tail really sticks out and it's almost pointy compared with a, a crow? So uh, uh, the larger size and that uh, tail, if you can see it, and that call will help you tell a raven from a crow. They're, they're very intelligent birds, both of them. Blue jay is about the same size as a robin. It's got a crest and it's blue with uh, some some black and and white and gray markings, and that's about that's about it. That was fairly distinctive. I don't think of any anything else with which you might confuse it. Here's one that's fairly common and it may be a significant problem: a flocking species. Starling is usually dark, but if you're relatively close to it. And it's this time of year, any time from middle fall through the spring, you'll see all these whitish spots on the body. So a dark bird with sort of a stubby tail. When you see it flying, you see that that tail is a bit stubby. And that's a starling. It's smaller than a robin and a strong flocking species. You can see uh, if you've got one, you usually have dozens or, or occasionally hundreds of them. Uh, the grackle is sometimes confused with starling, but uh, when you look at the fact that it has a really, really long tail and it's larger than a robin, that's usually an easy way to tell it, even when it's flying, that nice long tail close up or if it's it, so that the sun is reflecting on it, like this one by my bird feeder, you can see the beautiful metallic colors, especially on the head and that yellowish eye. This is one that spends a lot of time feeding on the ground, but in the fall they flock up and occasionally they cause some significant problems for us. Crackle. And uh, I'm sorry, this one I had to take with a stuffed specimen in the case outside my office, um, so it's a bit faded. A red-winged blackbird, usually we have a nice bright red wing patch. This one's uh, pretty faded because that specimen's almost 100 years old. but um, it's a little bit smaller than a robin, black with a reddish wing. Um, but notice not all blackbirds are black. In fact, the female isn't black at all. She's brown with a streaked uh, breast. So if you see a bunch of uh, birds, some of them are black and some of them are streaked brown, they, they're probably uh, blackbirds. And red-winged blackbird is our most common 
blackbird here in New England. So that's the end, Heather. Uh, I'll leave this slide up so people can get to see it. That publication to which I referred, I'm going to leave this up so you can see that URL and write it down and you can go directly to it. This is about a 20-page publication that I wrote a few years back and um, it's got a list of suppliers that hopefully is still helpful. Also, I see you're in Ber uh, in New Hampshire, we call it Berlin, but maybe in, you call it, in Vermont you call it Berlin, but that's where the uh, wildlife services people are, and that's their telephone number, and they are very, very helpful in dealing with all types of wildlife issues, not just bird problems. And then the publication that gives you instructions on nest box construction and nest platform construction is called Raptors in New Hampshire Orchards, and that's also on our website uh, under publications. You may have to do a little digging. Our website right now is under revision, and they're about to unveil it. Let me see what is to, I think it's due to be unveiled in a few unveiled in a few days. But if you search for that one by the title at our website, I hope you can find it. Heather, if people are still awake, uh, I'll see if I can answer questions. Okay, thanks, Alan. Any questions? Uh, Alan, you had a slide up of the uh, hail and uh, bird cloth or netting. Can, can you hear, Alan? I can hear that just barely. Go ahead. I'm uh, just wondering what, if you had any costs uh, associated with that product. You, you had costed out the net, the netting. I was wondering if you had anything on the cloth. The material is relatively heavy. And so in certain kinds of crops, it may not be appropriate. The growers with whom I sp spoke, who were down in the Plainfield region, um, there were several of them using these, were very happy about it, it being used in strawberries. And it was a material that uh, a couple of people could easily pick up and move and then use in a different application. And it's, it's tough enough that can be used for a number of years, we think. So I think it has some, some applicability. They were quite happy with it. I cannot tell you right now about the cost, but that's one of the reasons that I put a list of suppliers, and you can go online and look at some of these various products. Uh, OESCO, the Orchard Equipment Supply Company, is one that has a number of these, and they're increasing more and more of these products. But there are several others that are available in our region, and you can make up your own mind. I haven't used them myself at the Hort Farm, but I've talked with growers who have tried them, and so far people have been relatively happy. That's about all I can say. Thanks. Any other questions? We're not going to have any bird damage this year. Everything. We've got bird damage, but we've got all the answers, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. We're gonna, I like the Saddam Hussein approach with the blackbirds. Uh, are you <laughs> you're referring to the, Ram, the farmer Rambo image thing? Yeah. It doesn't kill, it doesn't ward the birds off, but it sure is gratifying. When <laughs> Uh, we, we, had, we had a couple of growers that commented that uh, it made them really feel good. And one of them, uh, but I must caution you about Farmer Rambo. Um, I believe it was, a, uh, it was either an Upper Valley New Hampshire or an Upper Valley Vermont grower that in the last year or so sometime got convicted for shooting four cedar wax wings, which are completely protected and cannot be shot. Yeah. legally and somehow this was discovered by the authorities so you want to be sure that you uh, 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 follow rules and so forth. Um, that particular thing got put in the newspapers and so people all over the state found out that farmer so-and-so had this particular problem and was convicted of such and such. It's not, especially if you're in a situation where you're a pick your own grower and you retail stuff, that's not a good image to cultivate. And even if you aren't, it isn't a good Im image for farming and it, it, as a whole to, to cultivate. So the lesson is shoot, shovel, and shut up. <laughs> um, no comments. This is being recorded. <laughs> uh, I, and somebody had problems in his barn, and he hung some uh, the netting for the bale netting vertically, 
So the birds would go flying through, they'd hit the net. Would that work in some places outside or not? It's possible to a, uh, that you might get a little bit of um, uh, effect from something like that. We had a high bush blueberry grower here in my state who had um, netting that was designed to protect the blueberries and, and the edges of course, the, the, the top of the netting is something like eight feet up and he put it that high so that people could walk underneath and not hit their heads on it. But the problem was that uh, it, it, uh, it hung vertically but didn't reach the ground. And it only took a week or so for the birds to figure out you just swoop underneath and fly right in. So they're, they're, they're intelligent. They learn pretty quickly. And I think that would have limited effectiveness in deterring stuff. Maybe some of the really dumb ones like cedar wax wings um, I hope there aren't any cedar wax wings in the audience. I'm, I'm sorry if I make you feel bad, but, but it may, maybe it might have some limited effect there, but I, I wouldn't have high expectations for that which you described. The, the other thing is when we had cows and had barns, had pigeons coming in, what worked was to go out there at dusk with a super soaker squirt gun with a little soap in it. Hmm. And, and, and I think I got bits of that. I didn't quite get a, a super soaker with a wetting agent, and that's been used, and that's been used in some situations to actually kill birds because they they're, they're, it, it, they lose their insulation, um, and uh, it has been used at certain times of the year. Uh, I'm guessing it must be very uncomfortable as well. I'm not sure if it might cause some mortality later on. I'm not sure about the legal implications of trying something like that. So I would want to um, perhaps anonymously contact your uh, local wildlife services people and ask them about the legality of that kind of issue. Maybe call them from a pay phone or something <laughs> and uh, uh, find out because there might be some legal ramifications that would pre prevent you from doing that kind of a thing. I, I would, I would want to uh, investigate that before I tried using that too much. Well, in Vermont, there's no season on pigeons. Has anyone tried um, spraying Avapel on, on any crops that you know of? I know we, we plant with it, you know, for uh, corn, we've used it in the seed box, but in out west, they've been doing experiments spraying it on the oil seed crops. I don't know. Has anyone tried that here? I have not. I'm not aware of anybody in this part of the country that's been testing that, and I was unable to go to the uh, regional uh, uh, wild, uh, wildlife damage conference uh, a couple of years ago when I hoped to be updated on some of that stuff. I was teaching in, in New Hampshire and couldn't make it. So I have not heard of any work. I'm going to be watching the literature, and I'm going to be trying to listen and pay attention but I work closely with my colleagues at Wildlife Services here in New Hampshire, and um, uh, between us, we'll try and be aware of what's going on. They are currently trying to get a New Hampshire label for some of that product, again, uh, for a seeding time application for here in New Hampshire, and that's the most likely applications. We'll be watching, and if we have something available, uh, uh, Cooperative Extension will be uh, uh, sending that information out and uh, trying to get it into the hands of the people that might take use, might uh, take advantage of it. I, I yeah. want One of the things we've had, a, we've had a problem with over the years was uh, snow geese. They will come in and they'll decimate a field faster than you can plant it. And they'll do it when they're just little seedlings. So what we've done is, we, when we've had that happen, we've talked with Fish and Wildlife and actually had some wardens involved where we load up our guns with shell poppers we literally would drive them away because we want them to go north anyways. So we little scare the living daylights out of them by a, by a team effort <laughs> and get them out of the valley. And we found that works really well. And again, it sounds like that problem is something that occurs for a very short period of time. Oh, Alan, are you there? I think we might have lost you. <laughs> 